Thank you very much uh, to Hein and to the IMI team for organizing this wonderful conference and for uh, having me here. I'm really delighted to, uh, to speak in this, uh, in this setting. So uh, the paper that I'm talking about uh, is on the, on the website and I'll, given the time limit, I'll, I don't intend to sort of try to cover all of it, but I've picked out some things. It's a sort of a think piece uh, rather than a coherent academic paper at this stage. Um, and that's on purpose in the sense that it revisits an earlier article, the article I wrote in 2002 on migration aspirations that Hein mentioned on the first day and acts as a sort of stepping stone towards one or more articles that I hope to write in the near future going back <coughs> to uh, the issue of migration aspirations and how they translate into actual migration. Uh, so this is the article that I'm looking back uh, upon, uh, called Migration in the Age of Involuntary Immobility, in which I proposed this model that I call the Aspiration Mobility Model of Migration, basically saying that in a population, uh, some people have the aspiration to migrate. And out of those that do, only some have the ability to also realize that aspiration, and those are the people that become the migrants that we can observe. And by separating ability from aspiration, we can discuss determinants of migration in a more precise way, I think. Uh, and that's been illustrated uh, at several points during this conference. So anything that we might think of as a, uh, as a determinant, either at the macro level or the micro level, could affect either one of those two and possibly in contradictory ways, or in the same way. So take a contextual factor like the oppressive regime in Eritrea. That's obviously affecting the aspiration of many people to leave. But ironically, it's also affecting people's ability to leave in the sense that Eritreans, more than any other Africans, are likely to be granted asylum if they reach Europe. Um, so, so the fact that they come from an oppressive regime also actually enhances their ability to gain foothold in, in Europe. And in the same way, we can think about a whole range of individual variables like, like uh, educational attainment could have one effect on aspiration and another effect on the ability to migrate and they might be pulling in the same direction or in different directions. So what we observe as migration is just the tip of the iceberg of the realized migration aspirations uh, and beneath that is a large volume of um, migration aspirations that remain unfulfilled. Um, and the, the proportions here are, are intentional and are actually supported by, by the data that we have on the numbers of people worldwide who would like to, to migrate to another country versus the ones that have actually done so. And so the, the article that I mentioned has been, it's been cited more than 150 times, which indicates that I was onto something, but it also raises a lot of new questions because every, or many of those publications point to some new uh, like apply the idea in a new setting or raise things that I didn't think about or in other ways really stimulates me to go further into this. Uh, and of course one thing that we are drawn to as migration researchers is the question of this line between the actual migrants and all those who remain involuntarily mobile. So that's what I call ability and which Hein later recast as capabilities which nicely made the connection between research on capabilities in other areas of, uh, of the social sciences or in, in development studies more specifically. Uh, and this line also has to do with the, um, with the effects of policy and what Giovanni Perry uh, talked about on the first day that if we really want to um, measure the impact of policy we shouldn't compare the migrants to all the non-migrants, we should compare the migrants to those who would like to migrate. Uh, so that's all about this line and there are so many questions to pursue on that uh, that are interesting and, and important but that I'll leave aside for now. And I'll ask, take a step back and ask a much more fundamental, fundamental question which is uh, necessary to pursue this approach at all which is what does it actually mean to have migration aspirations? And Giovanni when he presented the data that he used also mentioned sort of in passing that well we have this wonderful data, but we don't exactly know what went on in people's minds when they answered this question. 
Um, and having data like, like he does and that we also have in other data sets is something that I didn't have in 2002. Uh, and I think that in order to, uh, to pursue this, uh, this agenda, uh, we have to move forward in the same way as these intertwined arrows of the, of the Demig logo, both theoretically, empirically, with different methodologies and so on at the same time. But looking at uh, survey data is certainly one approach uh, to thinking about what migration aspirations are. So as migration experts, what would you, your guesses be as to how many percent of the population in these countries say that they would prefer to move permanently to another country rather than remaining in their own country? This is the United Kingdom at the bottom there. Uh, <laughs> So that's a bit of a, of a surprise to many of us. Uh, and I, of course, it's easy to use this to ridicule the data and, and question the methodology and so on. But I think more constructively, it raises questions about the ontology and epistemology of migration aspirations. What are migration aspirations and how can we actually learn something about them? Uh, and that led me uh, to rethink migration aspirations as a form of attitude. And the reason, the only, or the main reason for doing that is that research on attitudes in the social sciences builds upon very thorough discussions of ontology and epistemology that we don't really see in, uh, in the specific area of, of migration aspirations. So psychologists have, uh, and, and uh, yeah, social uh, psychologists have defined attitudes as a psychological tendency uh, to evaluate a particular object with some, or a, a particular entity with some degree of favor or disfavor. And these key terms, a tendency, evaluation, entity, can be useful to sort of, um, pick apart this notion of, of migration aspirations into um, components that we can, uh, that we can critically uh, um, review. Okay, I'll put that as a reminder on the side and go into each one of them. So first, tendency. That's key here, I think, because uh, migration aspirations are something that we easily think of as something that people have or don't have or that they might have to different degrees. Um, but it's, it really uh, reflects the elusiveness of migration aspirations. That it, it's hard to it's hard to get at methodologically. Uh, also, I think that the survey data that we do have really shows how sensitive uh, this notion is to how it's asked about in, in surveys. And also, I think what we don't see in, in one-off surveys, but which I really understand through fieldwork, is the variability of, uh, of migration aspirations. That people could express a, a desire to migrate one day and then the next day when you know, life looks a lot brighter, they would say no. Um, and that really points to this idea that it's, it's not something static, it's a, it's a tendency. <coughs> uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of survey research and some of the inspiration for, for, for working more on migration aspirations uh, comes from the work that I've done together with Hein and, and others on the you imagine project, imagining Europe from the from the outside, where we spent a lot of time developing a survey that looked specifically at migration aspirations. But I also feel very strongly that ethnographic approaches are essential to understanding how people uh, how people think about migration, and then in turn how they might respond to survey questions. So the next element is this. Uh, evaluation element. Uh, I said that um, attitudes are defined as, uh, as a tendency to evaluate a particular entity with some degree of favor or disfavor, but that favor-disfavor dimension sort of overlaps with a strength dimension. You can have a very strong conviction or it could be, it, it could be weak. And the way that I'm used to thinking of migration aspirations uh, is that it's you know, either something you have or don't have, or you could have it with different degrees of, of strength, but perhaps this is really not getting it right, because in some cases, staying also 
reflects some form of, of determination or, or desire. So perhaps the no wish either way is really the middle of the scale and then you have the wish to migrate at one extreme and the wish to stay at the other. Because a lot of people do live in settings where living is the norm and they might make a very deliberate choice to stay in a, in a conflict situation, for instance, staying to fight and not joining everyone who's leaving. Or in a rural community in northern Norway or Scotland when you're ending school and all your friends move to the big city, maybe you really want to stay. Um, <coughs> so I think the absence of a wish to migrate should not be taken to reflect an absence of, of aspirations to, to do something else, to stay. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, is this question of what is the entity that is being evaluated. And I think in migration research, we're used to thinking in terms of places and cost-benefit analysis of living in different places. What does living in one place mean versus living in another place? And that obviously has a long history in, in, in migration research. Uh, here, here is the uh, Everett Lee article from 1966 with the origin and the destination. Uh, and I think still there's a lot to learn from that article. Uh, but it's interesting in this context to see how it's very much focused on comparing two places, even though obviously he says also a lot about how different characteristics of places have different relevance for people in different situations, but it's still a comparison of places. So before leaving the idea of comparing places, I think one interesting avenue into this is to think not of uh, places taken for granted in the way that we're used to as sort of this country or that country, but also examining people's mental geography of the world, which is one thing we did in the, in the Imagine project, for instance, asking people uh, which countries do you think about when you hear the word Europe? And a lot of people said, you know, well, countries like Germany and Saudi Arabia and Canada. Uh, <laughs> And, of course, that was as interesting to our research on, on migration desires to, to go to Europe as uh, simply sort of taking for granted that people shared our notion of what Europe was. And it's also striking how in many communities around the world there are geographical terms to describe sort of the totality of desirable destinations out there um, that sort of represent the geographical category that could be called a place in a, in a very uh, large sense. But another interpretation of what entity is being assessed is uh, space, that maybe it's not really about engaging with particular places, but about space as a dimension. So here are two quotes to that effect, uh, Nina Sorensen and Finn Stepetal saying that experiences of mobility bestow authority on the moving subject, or Sigmund Bauman, Mobility has become the most powerful and most coveted stratifying factor. And incidentally, both of these have to do with you know, authority and power, but I think just as important it has to be, or engagement with space has to do with you know, the sense of personal fulfillment in your sort of life on Earth. Uh, so engaging with the, sp the spatial dimension, I think, is actually an important aspect of migration aspirations that we don't... Uh, think about as much as we perhaps should. Finally, we could think of the entity that's being evaluated as um, life projects, or um, you could use different terms like strategies, livelihood strategies, paths, scripts, uh, the point being that these are context-specific social constructions, uh, ideas about the possibilities you have, the repertoire of possibilities at uh, critical junctures in, in life. And then it becomes clear that you know, uh, understanding migration aspirations is more about understanding people's ideas about these projects than about taking migration as a fact and then seeing how people <coughs> evaluate that. And all of this, I think, is... Uh, um, how should I put it? They're not, they're not mutually exclusive approaches. I think a lot can be gained from using these different approaches to migration aspirations together, um, just like the arrows in the, in the logo. I'm running out of time, so I'll
conclude uh, in three brief points. The first one is that I think this two-step approach to migration is both successful and necessary. We have to ask you know, what makes people want to migrate and what makes them um, able to, to realize that aspiration. Secondly, I think this question, what does it actually mean to have migration aspirations, remains uh, open to further research. And lastly, I think that the way forward in doing so is to draw upon different literatures and methodologies, perhaps from areas of social science that we don't engage so much with as migration researchers um, usually, and to explore it both theoretically and empirically. So that's something that I, I very much hope to be doing in the coming years, to, to merge empirical and theoretical approaches to, uh, to this question. Thank you. <laughs>